I've always believed that leaders are not anointed by titles or responsibilities or tenure, but instead are those who bring energy, focus, and compassion to everything they do. So I've decided to put a spotlight on those who are using their unique leadership style to inspire change and drive meaningful action. Join me for a series of powerful conversations that will leave us all thinking about what it means to truly lead. Our next guest is a current head football coach and former linebacker known for his leadership both on and off the field. Gerard Mayo began his career in 2008. He quickly made a name for himself as one of the best in the league, a complete powerhouse who led the team in total tackles season after season. In his eight years with the franchise, Gerard racked up countless accolades as Defensive Rookie of the Year and a two-time Pro Bowl. But it's his natural ability to motivate and inspire his teammates that set him apart and led to an impressive seven-season run as team captain. Those same qualities as a leader led him to join the Patriots coaching staff in 2019, and he now serves as the 15th head coach in their history and their very first black head coach. Join me as I sit down with Gerard to learn about his journey toward leading one of the greatest dynasties of all time. Coach Mayo, great to meet you. Uh, Thank you you for being here, and uh, it's my pleasure having you on the show uh, today. So I noticed, and and I think uh, all the listeners out there are going to really appreciate this, but every stage of your career you've exhibited leadership. So all the advice you're going to give, anything you can offer is going to be great for our audience. So thank you again. I appreciate you having me. For a lot of us, uh, including myself, who have come in uh, throughout a career, we take over new positions, we take over... You know, we're, we're asked to take over a new business, a new organization. It comes with a new team, and they have done things a certain way in the past. And you're in that position now. What's your mindset walking in when you come into an organization and you try to uh, move them along and follow your vision and get and get fellowship? It's a little different for me because, you know, I was pretty much raised here. I was drafted here in 2008, and then I left for three years uh, when I retired, and I came back into this, this coaching role. I would say, you know, the difficult part, it's easy to see here and say like the culture is broken. I would say sometimes when people talk about culture, it's almost like a retrospective way of validating success or failure. Right. This team wins a lot, they must have a great culture, which is not always necessarily true. Or, you know, this team loses a lot, they must have a terrible culture, which is not necessarily true. We always talk about a shared vision. It's one thing for me to get up there and say, you know, we want to be a tough, smart, dependable football team, but I want the players, the guys who cross the white lines, to also have some input in the vision. And I think that's important because now they have stock uh, stock in the team. Right. And when things get hard, they, you know, they remember the things that we talked about on day one. And so going back to your original question, you know, how you change culture, I think the first thing is getting the right people there. Right. And so, you know, we brought in 17 new coaches and just through that, um, the culture has started to shift. When you talk about shifting culture as well, I'm just telling you, it's like trying to turn the Titanic. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Because you have people here, this is how we used to do it. Yeah. You know, and those people, either they get on board or not. And, and I think as a leader, you have to really set the North Star. And then also going back to the vision piece of it, most people can't see the vision. That's why it's a vision, right? It's like right, right here right, in your head. Right. And being able to clearly articulate uh, your vision and get buy-in from the coaches and then the coaches get buy-in from the players, then you're kind of you're on the right track. So that's how I kind of look at culture and, and establishing the vision for our team. Yeah, and, and you mentioned um, there that you grew up here and you were a player here and you had tremendous success here and were captain for the team. So when you were a player, what are two of the three things um, you learned from that experience that made you a better coach and made you a, a great coach later on? You know, as a player, coach used to always talk about players win games and coaches lose games. And I, I truly believe that. And, you know, you try to empower the players as much as possible. So the tool belt that we talked about when I was a player, I still use now for the, uh, for the coaches and also the players. I, I tell them, like, here's a canvas. I don't care what picture you paint on the canvas, just stay on the canvas. Right, right. And and that's just a couple of things that I've learned from being a player where Matt, Patricia, and Bill would give me the freedom out there on the field. I'm trying to do the same thing with our coaches. Yes. Give them the freedom. Uh, they are experts in their space. And I always tell them, you, it's your expertise. If you're the receivers coach, that's your like you should know that group inside and out, even better than myself. And so when I think about leadership, I know you didn't ask about this, but when I think about leadership, it's more uh, bottom-up leadership. It's more yeah. servant leadership. Yeah. And even this morning with the coaches, we had a you know 20-minute discussion on, like, I'm here to support you guys. 
And if, if I understand, you know, what you're trying to get out of this job and out of life, I can help you get there. And so my job as a head coach is, all right, to develop and help my coaches get to the point where they want to be. And hopefully you have enough employees that are trying to develop at the same time. So if you lose coaches when they get promoted, you just slide another guy right in. And that's that's uh, pretty much been my Yeah, you, and you, you literally cannot do everything and you cannot run every position. Right. you got to rely on your, your team yeah. as you develop them to, to excel and to do well in their particular uh, job right. as a team. And, yeah. and I, I talk about collaboration all the time. It's yeah. all about you know getting in a room, and you won't always agree, but when we get out of that room, like let's make sure we're all going in the same direction. All right, so just a little bit of a follow-up question to that, and kind of an interesting one, because I always look back at when I was younger. So you as a coach, what advice would you give your younger self as a player, knowing what you know now, and just uh, you know how would you adapt and do things differently? The, the only thing I would say is you know, to enjoy the moment and to be present. Um, sometimes when you're a player, like you're just all over the place. Yeah. Like you're looking in the past, you're looking in the future, and you don't really enjoy uh, the journey. You enjoy the championships and you enjoy the winning, but you don't really appreciate the process. So uh, that's what I would tell my guys. Yeah, yeah, good, good advice. In your second year, your teammates voted you a captain, which is which is just a little scary for me to, <laughs> to walk in. But how did you win over? I mean, some of these people who are voting for you have been in the league five, ten years, yeah. and and how did they see? Obviously, you were a great player, but how did they see the leadership qualities where they say, like, look, we're going right. to we're gonna vote him in as a captain? You know, when I was drafted to New England the year prior, they won every game but one. <laughs> and that was the Super Bowl. Yeah. So I knew I was going into an organization where uh, the best thing for me would be to be a sponge and try to learn from, you know, Tom Brady, Randy Moss, Vince Wilford, Richard Seymour, all yeah. those guys. Yeah. And that's what I did. Also, as a rookie, look, you know, you know when Bill was here, he was a hard-nosed kind of guy, and you know the veterans. This is back when two days were still going on, and the veterans would come up to me as the first-round draft pick and say, "Hey, hey, rookie, um, go in there and ask Bill, can we get out of pads, <laughs> out of full pads?" Yeah. And so for me, like I grew up where my mom, she would always say, uh, "If the worst thing a person can say is no, then go ask." I would walk in his office, and he'd be sitting there. He's a, he's a you know, one-finger typer, yeah, yeah, yeah. pencil in the ear, and I'd say, "Coach, um, you know the guys are kind of worn down." And, you know, they're tired. And, you know, 70% of the time he'd be like, I don't, I don't yeah, care, yeah. go back in the locker room. But the 30% of the time that he would say, you know what, Gerard, you're right, and I would go back and deliver the news to the rest of the guys. They, the guys, they would literally, like, pick me up, you know, put me on their shoulders, just so excited. But for me it was more about thinking about the guys. Right. I was going into the lion's den yeah. uh, for them. As a representative. As a representative. Yeah. And I think that carried over uh, into my second year where I was voted captain. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I don't know if I would have walked in there, but uh, good, <laughs> good for you. Um, you. You've talked in, I've seen other interviews where you've talked uh, what, it, what it means to serve as the first uh, black head coach in Patriots uh, history. In fact, you're um, one of the most diverse classes of coaches here in the league, and we have to keep progressing at that. I know that uh, for sure. But And how do you think um, that group, you included, can really change the league, or what, what will you bring to, what will you guys bring to the league? Yeah, for me, you know, I just want to be recognized as a, as a great coach before anything else. Yeah. I'm a man. Um, I would say oftentimes when, whether we're talking corporate America or even here uh, in football and sports, when they talk about diversity, it's usually just black and white. Yeah, yeah. And to me, you know, as we put this staff together, it was important for me to hire good coaches that are competent. But I also wanted to bring in people who thought differently. So diversity of thought, diversity of age, diversity of experience. Like there's so many different ways or so many different ways to really categorize diversity. And that's how I look at it. Uh, and saying that, I do understand like my role here is being the first black uh, head coach. But once again, we've had a coach here for, you know, for a very long time in the turnover. Uh, but it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity, and I don't take that lightly. Yeah. So this one, um, I'm, I'm speaking from a little bit of experience here because we just had 2,000 people join our company uh, okay. this week. Yep. And I notice every generation that comes in, um, you know, they're shaped by the, their surroundings. They're shaped by what's going around. How do you relate to that? How do you sort of adapt as a coach yeah. to that? I mean, you talked a lot about uh, communication and development. How, is that, you know, uh, how do you reach out and make sure, you know, you're getting them, as you said before, to buy into your vision? and yeah. And, and connect. You have to be agile in your thinking as a leader. Um, I, I would say most of the time, 
you know, you, you have mental agility. Everyone always talks about, you know, empathy and all that stuff. But really, I look at it as mental agility. And that's just being able to adapt and change. And, and when you think about it, the opposite of agility is what? It's rigidity. Right. And oftentimes, you know, older coaches, older people in general, they're so rigid in their thinking because that's the way they've always done it. And I think that could get you in a lot of trouble uh, sure. doing that. You know, you bring, you're bringing in thousands of, you know, men and women who – you know, they're ambitious, they have goals, they have dreams, and you just have to figure out what lever do I pull to get this group going the right way. Now, we talked about the vision in the North Star, like you absolutely have to do that. But as you work your way down or work your way up, you know, bottom up leadership, you just have to make sure that you empower that next level and then really show that you care about those people as individuals. Now, going back to the motivators, Everyone, you know, you have intrinsic motivators and you have extrinsic motivators. All you wanted to do back then was for Bill to say, good job. Yeah. Right. That was the intrinsic motivator for me. Once a month, maybe. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And he was so, like, he wouldn't, we call them attaboys. He wouldn't pat you on the back unless you went above and beyond. He wouldn't pat you on your back for doing your job. I mean, like, you're just doing your job. But if you went above and beyond, he'd be like, hey, that's a good play, Mayo. And, you know, it it would just... It would bring a feeling of just yeah, motivated, yeah, yeah, like yeah, just yeah. Going. Let's go. Yeah. And then other people, they're motivated, you know, extrinsically, and yeah. so that's money, that's you know, the stock yeah. option, like all those things. Right. And so I think it's important, especially with your let's call them emerging leaders. Some people say second tier, but let's call them emerging leaders. It's important that they understand that as they start to onboard uh, this younger generation. Yeah, and, and let's follow up on that because there's no two people that are the same, right? They're all different, different yeah. backgrounds, come from different places. You know, you have to reach somebody in a different way and how do you how do you manage that type yeah, of con yeah you know, I think Jimmy Johnson said this he uh, he said you know you can't treat everyone the same but you want to treat everyone fair right if Tom Brady is 20 minutes late to a meeting you're not gonna say Tom get out of here here like you're done <laughs> yeah, yeah, right and at the same time you know if you have a rookie that's late to a meeting you may try to send a message to him early on right. and I, I just think you know if we operate you know, in a fair sense, then everything will kind of work itself out. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me uh, switch gears for a second. And I'm going to think this one's right up your alley. I always say preparation for me is key. I've got to prepare, prepare, prepare. And then when I get in the market with customers, we can perform as a business. And I think in your profession, more than ever, people don't see the preparation that goes into it every single week. And you've mentioned before, you've got that detailed kind of mindset. You just give a little sense. How much do you prepare yeah. for a week? And then, and then how do you do it and how do you look at that? And yeah, it's interesting you bring that up, um, you know, because my, my thought process around that has kind of changed a little bit. I think it is important to prepare. And you can probably pull out a couple of business examples from the example I'm going to give you on the football field now. So every team, every offense, for the most part, they script their first 15 plays. And so when I say that, like they have their first 15 plays, how they're going to call it, beginning of the game and beginning of the second half. Right. And so you can watch all the film you want to on the last, let's say, four games or how they played you before and try to predict. But at the same time, we have to realize that we are predicting. And so for me, when I talk to the players, it's about awareness. Because once, once you're on the field, like I can't help you. And so where's the quarterback? Is he in the shotgun? Is he under center? Where's the tight end? Where is their best receiver located? Yeah, you have to know that. Exactly. What's the down and distance? And so really, over the last couple of years, I've been preaching just overall awareness. It's when I worked in business. All right, here's a perfect example. I worked at United Health Group. Yeah. And so my first year, I was like an executive in residence, really just kind of bouncing around the organization, trying to learn about healthcare. And then when I finally got to sales, right, I started in strategy and went to financial services, all that stuff. And I finally got to sales. I remember very vividly walking into a meeting. I, you know, I was leading this meeting, the first time I'm going to lead this sales meeting. And I had been studying all week, bam, bam, bam. And so my mentor, he was my boss at the time too, Mike Mateo, we, you know, we went to uh, this company to sell total population health management. I thought I knew everything. And so I'm in there, everything's flowing, everything's going smooth. And it was like 30 minutes into my presentation, one of the guys asked me a question that I did not prepare just for. Just like derailed right. you a little it bit. It der- yeah. derailed my presentation. And I just remember looking over at my manager who was with me, my, my mentor. And he came in and he was, just, he was so prepared, but at the same time, like he understood like the full picture. Right. And so we can sit here and give people rules. Like, here you go. Here are all these rules. 
But when you're in the game or when you're at that sales meeting, there could be something that's going to come out of left field, right field. And this is why I was talking about like being aware and having having a heavy tool belt. Right. You need to be able to pull these different tools out. You could walk into a meeting and something come out of left field, and you have to be able to handle that. Yeah, you gotta you gotta be think on your feet. That's right. Yeah, you gotta think on your with feet. all that information. That's right. At your hand to, to get the best possible answer. That's right. Yeah. But you know, even with that information at your hands, like you can't just pull your phone out, right? <laughs> it's the same thing on the field. You right. have all this information, right. and and oftentimes I would say, coaches in general. You know, they would have you watch so many hours of film. This is how I grew up. They would have you watch so many hours of film. And it was almost, as the employee or the player, it was almost like the coach was just making me watch film so he can say, hey, I showed you that clip on Wednesday. Yeah. Even though I watch 5,000 clips. Yeah. You know, I can do training all day long until I get into the situation and apply it. That's right. It just never sinks in. That's right. You know, I have to do before. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's sort of some of the same way. It's, yeah, That's you right. got to do the, the prep on the, on, on the uh, film, but you got to get on the field and practice it at some point, see what it I, looks like. I agree. There's always this sort of pressure, of course, to succeed in the short term. Yeah. And, but you know you're trying to build for the long term and do the right things. But how, when it doesn't, how do you manage that conflict and shut out the noise? It's like, look, yeah, I know i got to perform in the short term, but I've also got this long-term goal. I'm building something. I've got to, going back to that vision thing, yeah. and I want to put those in place. And how do you, like, shut out all the outside forces so you can, you can get that done? Yeah, yeah, to me, like, you're running a race, but you don't know where the finish line is. Um, you always have short-term goals. In our profession, just know you're going to be evaluated or critiqued on all of those short-term <laughs> yeah, goals. Yeah, for sure. But, yeah. but, you know, as we build this team, like my main focus, my North Star is the long term. Yep. And, you know, of course you have things along. Like look at this football field out here. Like, all right, we have our touchdowns, right? We have our touchdowns here, but we got to gain 10 yards before we can get right, 100 right, yards. Right, right. Like what steps do we have to take? What short-term goals do we have to meet? to get us to the end, yeah. to get us to the touchdown. Yeah. So I, I, it is a balance. And look, as a leader, everyone's not going to like you. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's okay. Everyone's not going to like you in the building, and everyone's not going to like you outside the building. Yeah. I pretend they like me. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you but know, know they don't. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. But, but at the same time, yeah. through relationships, we still need to. It's an honest exchange. It's, yeah, it's yeah, an yeah. honest exchange. We yeah. still need to make sure that we're going in the same direction. Yeah. What's, what's, like, we both can win. Yeah. And that once you start to get teams thinking like that, that we all can win, that's where now, going back to the long-term goals, you'll have that yeah. sustained success. Right, right, right. Excellent. And uh, you mentioned, um, I know after you retired as a player you, yeah. and you went into the business world and were very successful, but what were some of the things you as a player uh, brought into the business world you thought helped you, Yeah. right? And then maybe vice versa, what are some of the things you learned in the business world that you know, uh, came out and you sort of still keep as a mindset as a coach? I just think the competitiveness, and I would always hire athletes, honestly. Yeah. Athletes sure. that played at a high level. It's about competitive. Like, you have to be a competitor. You have to be a competitor in the boardroom. You have to be a competitor out here on the field, right? And I would say one thing I took from working in the business world, look, it's no secret in football is a male-dominated it's a male-dominated sport, whether we're talking about, oh, obviously, the players, but staffs and coaches, coaches and things yeah, like that. Yeah. And so what I did learn was just how to effectively communicate with a person who has 30 years of experience in healthcare, how to, how to you know, properly you know, communicate with you know, this 30-year-old you know, white woman or this, you know, because you don't yeah. have that here in football. Right. And so just being able to like, have these different conversations uh, with different people and different backgrounds that definitely has helped me now here at New England. I'm trying. I'm bringing in people like that. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. bring in, you know, the older person. I'm going to bring in a person that may not be a let's say football person. Right. And and that is, it's truly helped me. It's awesome. Uh, aspiring leaders, people that are that are growing up, or or people that are moving through the ranks. Uh, what what is sort of the best advice you can give them as they try to make that progression? Yeah, I would say, you know. I'm still in this from General McChrystal. I love their like, yeah, read, yeah. You know, leaders. It doesn't only have to be football or you know on the battlefield. It could be an elementary teacher. I always try to take little things. One thing I would say that General McChrystal talks about, like historically, people always thought about leadership as All right, we're playing chess and I'm just moving chess pieces on a board. Right. Um, and I talked about this at my presser as well. To me, leadership is really like a gardener. Like gardeners really don't grow anything. They put the seeds on good soil. 
right? They water it, they take the weeds out, and whatever grows, grows. It's more, it's more of a let them go through experiences. Let them go through the struggles because that's where you're going to learn the most. Right. I would also say, like, even now, our coaches, you know, out there on the field, like I said, we brought in 17 new coaches. They're trying to make an impression, too. Yeah. So, at the same, so the guys are on the field. You know, someone's messed up, and the coaches are yelling from the sideline, hey, why not, why not, why? It's like, no. Like, let this guy fail right, right now. And he'll learn. That's right. Because the only time that ever was effective was during the COVID season where there were no <laughs> fans in the stands, yeah, right? And yeah. I'm like, back up! <laughs> and then you can't do that. You can't do that out there on the field. I would also say, like, give people, like, if you, if you want your muscles to grow, right? You're going to have to get in the weight room. You're going to have to strain and it's going to hurt. You already know that delayed onset soreness. Right? Right, right. And so the next couple of days, you're going to be sore. But if you stay in this comfortable place, I'm always just going to curl 20 pounds. You're not going to get yeah, better yeah, for the long term. Yeah. And so those are, those are just a couple of things that I would say that leaders really need to focus on. Oh, I love it. Thank you. And uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us. And I know your time's tight. Good luck. Best of thank luck you. in the year. Uh, all the luck in the world. And you thank love you. hearing your thoughts. So thank you. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you to Gerard for taking us through his career journey and for giving us insight into what it's like to be part of and lead one of the greatest franchises in history.